Welcome back to the Morgan Street and Show. Roxanne Wilder with you and Pat George is here as well. And we are running through some of the pandemonium that we've seen historically as it relates to global warming and hearing from some experts in the past and whether or not their predictions have come true. Would you all know the year we had the very first Earth Day? You remember that year? Mm -hmm. What year was it? Do you remember? In the 80s? 1970. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. 1970 was, the, wow. was, the, 80s was the first Earth Day, right? Well, I, I remember them in the 80s. It was a big deal back then. Yeah. Now, when the first Earth Day came around, there was a lot of this kind of climate alarmism going on. And that's part of the reason that they had the first Earth Day. Now, the thing is, what you'll notice is a lot of the initial alarmism was that we were going into some kind of a period of cooling and famine from cooling, Right. So this has switched around a few times, folks. You got to, to me, you got to recognize that. You know, in the, in the late '60s and early '70s, they're talking about cooling. Now, let's see, January 1970, Life magazine. Remember Life magazine, that big old thing with color pictures? That was a great mm-hmm. magazine. But anyway, they reported, and who wouldn't trust Life magazine? But they reported, quote. Scientists have solid experimental and theoretical evidence to support the following predictions. In a decade, urban dwellers will have to wear gas masks to survive air pollution. By 1985, air pollution will have reduced the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth by one half. One half! How about the Boston Globe, April 16th, 1970? The headline is, Scientist Predicts a New Ice Age by 21st Century. Now, this is James P. Lodge, Jr., who's a scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And he says air pollution may obliterate the sun and cause a new ice age in the first third of next century, which I guess means we've got about 10 years to go until our new ice age will be here, right? Another segment of that article says the demands for cooling water will, quote, now this is cooling water for like electrical uh, equipment and cooling towers and things like that. It will, quote, boil dry the entire flow of the rivers and streams of the continental United States. Now, what's the solution? The article tells us population control. So there we go again with population control. Now, how about the very first Earth Day? There were all kinds of quotes at that time, all kinds of things said. Again, that's in 1970. How about Harvard biologist George Wald? He estimated that civilization will end within 15 or 30 years unless immediate action is taken against the problems facing mankind. And we have plenty more quotes from that Paul Ehrlich, who was apparently just a major doomsday uh, naysayer type in the 1960s and 70s, talking about how the world was going to end. And he wrote some books on it and other stuff like that. But then we had a another professor from North Texas State University, Peter Gunter. He wrote in 1970, quote, Demographers agree almost unanimously on the following grim timetable. By 1975, widespread famines will begin in India. These will spread by 1990 to include all of India, Pakistan, China, and the Near East, Africa. By the year 2000, or conceivably sooner, South and Central America will exist under famine conditions. By the year 2000, just 30 years from now, the entire world, with the exception of Western Europe, North America, and Australia, will be in famine. Now, you tell me, is that what happened? He forgot one thing. What did he forget? A lot of people went on a diet. (laughs) That's right. That's right. That was the solution, not population control, calorie control. How about the Washington diet? That was the the low fat diet, exactly. The low fat diet, which then the low carb diet, which I mean, then the paleo diet. I mean, again, to the meatless. Nobody knows, right? It's rotating. But scientists said, Dad Gummit. Scientists said they know. They're smart. They study these things, and they said. And I think it was a little bit different back then, too, because that you'd had these reports from these experts, and maybe the reports were coming on the nightly news or in the paper, but you didn't have that groundswell of people on social media sharing it and talking about it in that particular way. So maybe it didn't feel as scary. Right. Now let's catch another Ice Age one, okay? This is the Washington Post, July 9th, 1971. The headline reads, U.S. Scientist Sees New Ice Age Coming. Now this is a different person, Dr. S.I. Rasool of NASA and Columbia University. I mean, how could he be wrong? NASA and Columbia University? Mm -hmm. And here's the quote. In the next 50 years... 
He says pollution would cause temperatures to drop by six degrees and such temperature would be sufficient to trigger a new ice age. Now, he's also supported in the article some great journalism by The Washington Post who went out and found another scientist to back him up, Dr. Gordon MacDonald, who's on pres- at that time was on President Nixon's three-person Council on Environmental Quality. And he says that Dr. Rasool is a first-rate atmospheric scientist. And his predictions are consistent with those that Dr. McDonald and others have made. He says, I, but I, I changed it to Dr. McDonald for you so you would know uh, what was being talked about. Also, during the uh, early 70s, December 3rd, 1972, there was a letter sent to the president on Brown University letterhead. And it says that a group of 42, 42, Dad Gummit, these people are all right. 42 top American and European scientists recently held a conference on past and future changes of climate. And what they told the president was, quote, the main conclusion of the meeting was that a global deterioration of climate by an order of magnitude larger than any hitherto experienced by civilized mankind is a very real possibility and indeed may be due very soon. In January of 1974, January 29th, The Guardian, that UK paper, had a headline, quote, space satellites show ice age coming fast. Now, of course, you'll remember that sometime subsequent to that, I think it was in the 80s, they switched. They switched over from ice ages coming to what? Global warming. Mm -hmm. Global warming is here. Remember? And we had all those pictures, um, you know, of the ozone layer. In fact, there was in 1974, UPI, United Press International, had a headline out, Great Peril to Life. Gas pairs away the Earth's ozone. And I'm sure those of us who are old enough can remember that, you know, all those pictures of the ozone layer being melted away by CFCs at the time. I was going to try to say it, but, <laughs> but I probably trip over mm-hmm. trying to say that chlorofluorocarbons. You did it. I did it. I made it. But, you know, that was the big story when, when you know, at least when I was younger, when I was a young person, I remember hearing about that, you know, global warming is coming. Now, there's, there's a lot more quotes. I mean, New York Times, January 5th, 1978. Here's the headline. International team of specialists finds no end in sight to 30-year cooling trend in the northern hemisphere. This is based on a report prepared by German, Japanese, and American scientists. I mean, they couldn't all have gotten it wrong, could they? The findings indicate that from 1950 to 1975, the cooling per decade of most climate indexes in the northern hemisphere was 0.2 to 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. So if that trend was legitimate and continued, well, we wouldn't have had the global warming trend that everybody was talking about in the 80s and 90s, which then, of course, morphed into climate change is their new word for it, because that one can't be challenged. That way they're not saying global cooling or global warming, you know, because neither of those are borne out by the facts, apparently. That way they're just saying climate change. Now, we have had a lot more stuff that has been said about it more recently, and I wanted to just touch on some of that. For example, I don't know if you remember this, but this stuff is really hard to find on the Internet. This stuff is hard to find, but Al Gore's dire predictions in the mid-2000s. I don't know if you remember them, but in January 2006, Al Gore said that we only had 10 years left before the planet turned into a, quote, total frying pan. Mm-hmm. A total frying pan, 10 years, 2006. So that would have been what? Almost four years ago, right? That it should have been a total frying pan. But yet here we are. We survived. And Al Gore really spawned all of the industry that supports, which, you know, it's good to have conservation efforts in some areas. But he spawned all of that where you're now getting your credits and you're now getting, you know, it's whole, it's a big business, basically, because of his predictions back in 2006. Well, yeah, he respawned it, right? Because that's the point is this has actually been going on for mm-hmm. 50, 60 years. This industry has been around with scientists. I mean, you know, part of the way they make their living is to have uh, different groups fund their scientific experiments and have them write scientific papers. So this climate alarmism drives money into the system to do studies, that they can try to put out that support their dire predictions. Okay, and we don't really remember that, that scientists are in business too. They're not just, you know, these kind of arbiters of truth who just exist outside of, of monetary considerations like the rest of us. 
How about in 2008, there was a segment aired on ABC News that predicted New York City would be over, would be underwater by June of 2015. In 2008, Al Gore predicted there's a 75% chance that the entire North Polar ice cap would be completely melted within five to seven years. I mean, and it just goes on and on. I don't know if you remember, but there was the, all these U.N. Folks and other climate scientists were up in arms at the beginning of the Obama administration. And I mean, a a direct quote at the time, one of the headlines said, Obama has four years to save the world. This is January 19th of 2009. NASA scientist and climate expert Dr. James Hansen issued a dire warning to President-elect Barack Obama saying he had four years to save the world. Four years. That's it. I mean, they were telling us this. They were telling us this back in the mid 90s. Okay, there was a Rio Climate Summit, 1992, and the conclusion of that is you got 10 years left, 10 years to make a change and save the world. They've been telling us this since the early 2000s, when an inconvenient truth came out. Is that you've only got 10 years left? Well, then we're getting towards the end of the 2000s. We've got Al Gore out there saying you've got maybe 10 years in 2006. By 2080, saying you got five to seven years, right? I mean, this is just over and over and over again. They have made these predictions. I mean, in uh, there's all kinds of stuff. In 2009, NASA and the Goddard Space, Flace, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center head James Wasson said that Obama had four years to save the Earth. Okay, uh, think about this. They've been saying these same things over and over and over again for all these years, and we're supposed to believe that this time it's really true. I mean, this reminds me a little bit of a couple of stories, a couple of old fairy tales. The Boy Who Cried Wolf, right? Remember The Boy Who Cried Wolf? But this time the wolf is really here. Well, they've been crying wolf since the 60s. And like we said, first it had to do with global cooling, then it had to do with global warming. Now they've changed it to just catastrophic climate change and to bring us forward to date we're told in october of last year by the un again we've got 12 years now 12 years to fix things and this is where alexandria ocasio cortez came up with her 12-year prediction supporting her green new deal that if we don't fix things in 12 years by 2030 the world's over I mean, the world's been going to be over now for 50 years, and guess what? It hasn't happened. None of those predictions have come true. So I'm sorry, Chicken Little, but the sky ain't falling. Thank you for listening to The Morgan Streetman Show. We hope you enjoyed what you heard, and if you did, please click like and subscribe to help us out. And remember that we recommend that you exercise your brain at least once a week.